Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so today we're, well, we've been asked to go over sort of an overall review of all four exams. Um, in Ontario, we have done this a few times um, as in sort of one hour sessions per exam and it's kind of an open discussion format. And we're hoping that you guys will jump in with your questions at any time um, because I think it's more valuable if you ask questions because we may not talk about particular issues you're having or uh, challenges you might face or if, if you have uh, resources beyond the ones that we're about to talk about that might be helpful for everyone else it would be great to hear about those um, so we are uh, Leah and Mark and we're the associate member representatives on OLA Council um, and we both work for the same company actually <laughs> we work for IBI group and we've both passed three of the four exams at this point um, so exam number four uh, we will sort of we won't we'll have first-hand knowledge of um, but I have spoken to other OALA members who have written it in the past um, so we should have uh, some information to share with you um, so today we're going to go through the basics of CLARB and how to set yourself up to write the exam and then the four sections of the layers and then uh, we'll talk about the structure of them and some tips for studying and additional resources and you're welcome to ask questions at any time. So uh, the first thing you're gonna need to do if you haven't already done so is to log into CLARB or create an account on CLARB website. And this is what the website looks like. Uh, so you're gonna click in the top uh, right hand corner, create an account, and then uh, that's going to allow you access to uh, to create a council record, which is what you will need in order to maintain your uh, layer pro uh, progress through CLARB. And they will communicate that back to your association. Um, so you have you have to renew that once a year unfortunately so it is a, a cost uh, it's about I think it's $160 US now per year so it's within your best interest to try and speed through this layer process as quickly as you can um, but to create a council record you'll log in you'll click on my council record or you can access it through the take the exam section and it's got a link in the uh, process of how to sign up for the exam and so that might require you to provide uh, uh, them with a transcript. Um, but I think in Ontario and BC, at least, that's not necessary and probably in Alberta as well. Um, and, then, and then you're going to register for an exam. So you click on register for the exam, uh, walk through the steps to select whichever section you're going to write uh, in your jurisdiction. And then once you've done that, uh, then CLAR will send you a confirmation email with instructions on how to schedule your exam, uh, which will take you to the Pearson View website, which looks like this. And you'll sign in using your CLARB credentials, um, and it will automatically populate an account on Pearson View for you. Um, now I have one tip. Uh, when you're signing or when you're creating your CLARB account uh, and filling in all of your personal information, uh, I would suggest that you do not include any sort of extension numbers or anything on, on business telephone numbers uh, because it will create issues for you in this process of transferring information over to Pearson View, which happened to me, so I had to call them and deal with it. Um, so just put strict telephone numbers in. And then uh, once you sign in, in this page, this is what you'll be landing on. And it will tell you um, up in the top section that you have a, an exam that you've 
basically paid for but is not scheduled yet and because both Lee and I had not paid for one we're not taking one in August so um, it doesn't show up on this graphic but um, you would just follow the instructions after that to pick your testing center and uh, the time in which you want to write the exam. So now we'll move into the first uh, section. So we just kind of thought it would be a good idea to loosely run through all the information for each exam and kind of the experience that we had with it and what helped us with each exam. So all of this information can be found in the layer orientation guide and then again is just our own personal experience with writing these exams. So this breakdown, you can see that for section one project and construction management is broken down into pre-project management, project management, bidding, construction, and maintenance. So if you go on to the next slide here, Mark. So this is a further breakdown. So in the layer orientation guide for each exam, they tell you the percentage that's covered for each section, but then they also give you more specific topics as well. So I don't think I'm gonna go through each one, but so one of the most helpful things that I did was I printed these breakdowns off. And as I was studying each section, I'd make sure that I was crossing off every single one. So I didn't wanna leave any single topic unchecked when I was going through the books or other resources or just you know, anything that was left just talking to other people about and wondering where they would get that information from. So for this section specifically, I found that there were a lot of really lengthy, wordy questions. So it's really important to read the questions carefully and pick out key words that will relate back to the answer as well. So read the entire question first and then go back and figure out exactly what it is that they're asking you. So for this one, there's four books that are on the main reading list and they are the professional practice of landscape architecture, construction contracts, project management for design professionals and sustainability and design ethics. So these are the four main reading books and they also have some additional resources listed as well say you read through all of these books and you're still feeling like there's some gaps in your knowledge, then that's kind of what these additional resources are there for. Um, you might not need to read all of them depending on, say, how thoroughly you might read each book, um, but that's totally up to your own discretion. Like you might have some prior knowledge on some of these subjects and some of them might be totally new. So what I did when I was reading through these books in the beginning was that breakdown of all the, the topics. I cross-referenced them in the index of the book, so not to waste my own time. And to make sure that I could get through all the resources, I picked out the certain chapters that I found would be useful and were also mentioned on that breakdown for the exam, and I specifically read those ones. The book that I found the most useful for this exam was construction contracts because when I was cross-referencing between the breakdown and the index of the book I found that almost all of the subjects were captured. I did read the other ones not as thoroughly but just to fill in any gaps in my knowledge that you know may have not been as adequately touched in construction contracts. So just from mine and Mark's own personal experience some topics that we found were heavily mentioned or covered on this exam were general knowledge of the responsibility of all the players. So say, for example, you need to know the difference between the contractor, client, subcontractor, consultants, who does what, and during what phase of the process, who does what. And so when they would do things, so when all these players would come into the picture and through what process of the full length of a project they would come in. So there's also heavily weighted on um, like bidding the project process. So from start to finish, you need to understand the way that a project works from RFP, tender, contract admin, and who does what in each various process. 
Um, and just uh, a note that on these slides, uh, anything that's an additional resource is actually not a CLARB suggested resource. These are resources that we have found useful through either our studying or um, other members of the OLA who have come forward and said, you know, I looked at this and I thought it was useful. So um, they're not CLARB specific uh, recommendations, but we've provided them here because uh, our members have found them useful. And I'll just say that for me, uh, I agree with Leah, the contracts doc, a book was the most important one. Um, I would say that the second most important book is the project management book. If you are unfamiliar with the way in which a project functions from start to finish. So section two is titled inventory and analysis and uh, the main categories are site inventory, physical analysis and contextual analysis. Um, and this exam is probably the easiest one to take right after you've finished graduating. Uh, so the topics are further broken down here on this slide. Uh, the ones in bold are the ones that we have found to appear most often or most heavily. Um, so that's just uh, to help you if you need to sort of focus your studying because you're running out of time. Um, but uh, this exam, I think the main points that, uh, that you should cover are really to just understand what the inherent difference is between an inventory and an analysis on a site. Um, the books should help you to frame that, um, but that will be sort of the main focus of them testing you. They'll ask you questions about, you know, um, contours and slope analysis and all kinds of other things. But what they're really trying to get at is to make sure that you understand the clear difference between when you're assessing a site's inherent conditions and uh, features and then when you're actually taking that a step further to create uh, a reason for why you're you're impacting your design choices moving forward and that's sort of the analysis component of it so the reading list uh, suggested by Clarb includes design with nature uh, which is an Ian McCard book which um, I don't find particularly that helpful. Um, it's good if you wanna flip through it to see sort of what the different kinds of uh, inventories and analyses you can do on site, but um, the book itself I don't think is particularly helpful. Um, the site analysis book and the site planning and design handbook, I think are more helpful on this exam. Again, um, I would stress that you review the topics that will be covered on the exam, review the table of contents for each book, and read through the sections of the book that are pertinent to this exam. For instance, the site planning and design handbook will show up again on the reading list for future exams. So it won't, you don't need to study the whole book for this exam in particular. Um, so some of the key topics that we have seen on the exam um, are understanding sort of types of soils and the differences between them and their makeup. Um, understanding sustainable design and sustainable design features and how to, you know, benefits of brownfield development, uh, what the benefits of urban trees are, uh, buffers and sunshade analysis, uh, microclimate issues, uh, also understanding and being able to read contour maps and uh, understand how water is draining on a site from that. Uh, being able to distinguish between types of wetlands, um, 
different types of, you know, understanding groundwater and the hydrology cycle um, and different types of pollution. So there's the last cube about sort of point source pollution versus alternate. Um, and then, and then understanding more of the public consultation process, uh, because that will be part of this exam as well. So just to add on to that, I remember personally my exam having a really heavy um, topic on the different types of maps and surveys. So not every exam is the same. Um, but I, I just wanted to let people know that like knowing the different types is also quite useful and what different components are of each map and survey and where you would gain that information, um, under what circumstances you would be required to know that information. Um, I, I personally just had a lot of questions on maps and surveys on exam two. Yeah, so they'll typically show you a diagram or they'll ask you like, you know, here's an, uh, a symbol, like what does this mean on a map? Um, and, but they'll often show you like a site and then ask you a question about it. Um, so it's still sort of a multiple choice question, but there's usually a graphic that's associated with what they're asking you. Um, so just be able to recognize and understand uh, maps essentially when you see them and what they're showing you. So section three is the design section. And this section was quite tricky to study for, I found in my experience, um, because on the exam, most of it is application based. And something to note for this exam is that they can't actually ask you any questions specifically pertaining to say like your personal jurisdiction so because mark and i work in the city of toronto i just found it tricky to sort of not revert back to specific design standards that i use in my everyday life so you have to really focus on general design concepts and best practices that are universal for this exam so the topic breakdown here is stakeholder process, master planning, and site design. So here they're, they're mostly going to be testing you through application. So because it's design, um, there's not a lot of questions that will be specifically asking you knowledge. It'll, it'll be a lot of examples and a lot of graphic examples. So a lot of placing things on a map, a lot of um, picking out areas that have issues and stuff like that. So if we just go on to the reading list here, what I found the most useful for this exam personally was the, the TSS book. And that was because I was trying to just understand what was the, the general best practices. And I found it just useful because they had a lot of specific design standards that were universal. So I was just almost trying to retrain my brain back to foundational knowledge for this and less of my own specific work knowledge that I had gained. So other books that I found really useful were the graphic standards because a lot of the questions on the exam are quite graphic in nature, if not mostly graphic. I found that one really useful in terms of just interpreting plans and stuff like that. So on this, they're, they're mostly testing for general competency in terms of like site design and, and master planning. Um, there were a lot of questions relating to reverting between plans and sections. So in terms of topography and grading and stuff like that, they'll, they'll give you a plan and then you'll have to select the appropriate section. That was something that we both noticed. Um, there's a really heavy emphasis on site circulation um, in terms of both pedestrian and cycling and also correlated safety. Safety is number one 
um, from my experience, a lot of the questions were safety related. And also in terms of accessibility. So some general standards that you can actually study are in related to accessibility, like slope ramps, um, widths and stuff like that. So those are quite universal. So I did have a couple questions specifically on that. And also transit oriented design is a big topic as well that I found. Yeah, I'll say, I think this is possibly the most challenging of the four exams uh, from a testing standpoint, because uh, a lot of people get hung up on not answering the question that's being asked of them or taking into consideration additional uh, you know, contextual issues that have not been identified in the question. So when they ask you to solve a site design issue, they usually ask you to solve it through a particular lens on this test. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they only want you to solve it through that lens, even though they're may, in real life, you may not ever, you know, make the move that you're supposed to select because you know it's going to be maybe the most expensive way to solve the problem but that wasn't the question that they asked you so you have to be able to sort of abandon the way that you would normally approach a design challenge and consider it from the layer world perspective and only consider it from the perspectives that are being asked of you within the question or that are being presented to you on the graphic that accompanies the question. So if there's no information about, you know, I don't know, if you don't know like where the prevailing wind is coming from, like because they haven't told you, then that's not really a consideration in the answering of that question. So just be really clear about what it is and what lens through which you have to answer the question. That would be my recommendation. Um, but you'll probably find that you leave this exam really unsure about what you just wrote and whether or not you passed, which is a similar ex experience that most of us have had. Yeah, I'll definitely agree with Mark that on this one, one of the biggest challenges was actually figuring out what they're asking and understanding that if they don't mention it in the question, it's probably not a consideration. So inherently, you might think of things like cost or, or just any other situational um, elements that aren't mentioned in the question. So if it isn't asked as a part of the question, you have to really focus in on what they're asking you. And that's really important on this exam. Okay, so the last section is the grading, drainage, and construction management section. It's broken down into site preparation plans, general plans and details, specialty plans, and specifications. Uh, as I noted, um, both Leah and I have not written this exam yet, um, but uh, these are sort of the topic breakdowns and the general approach to studying for this exam would be the same as the others. Um, and this one tests more specific technical knowledge. It doesn't require nearly as much interpretation of, um, you know, additional influences. So it will it's more of a technical exam. And for that reason, I think it's easier to study for. Um, you just have to remember a lot of information, unfortunately. Um, so the recommended reading list um, is shown here. I won't go through all of them, but uh, definitely the Time Saver Standards is a key book. Uh, the site engineering book is going to be really important. They actually take a specific graphic out of that um, book, which is the stormwater retention and detention ponds. 
And on a lot of the tests, they ask you to complete labeling of these um, different graphics. And so it's really important that you understand inherently the differences between a stormwater retention and a stormwater detention pond. Um, and then the graphic standards book um, is also really helpful for a lot of technical information on construction detailing. Um, so really what you should know is really focus on stormwater management. I've heard from the past that it is quite heavily weighted on questions relating to stormwater management. Um, understanding sediment and erosion controls. Um, so what types of controls are there? Uh, what are, why are they used? Um, and when are they used? Um, and then contours and grading and understand how to properly grade a site according to you know, movement of water away from say buildings or um, maintaining accessible routes. And then uh, it's important to understand specifications, um, what their purpose is, what kind of information is contained in specifications, uh, or understanding the order of construction. So like at what stage in the construction process will varying things be covered. So like at what point do you, at some, some of the questions will ask you to place varying construction phases in an order in which they would be uh, followed on a typical project. So you should understand how a contractor typically sets up a site and in what order they will build things. Um, understanding construction detailing uh, and you know I've heard that there's questions on, you know, you can get specific questions on fastener types, um, understanding, uh, you know, like how to properly frame a wood deck or like how, how a sidewalk's put together. Um, and then, uh, and then what kind of plans you usually include in a construction package. So like a demolition plan, um, you know, tree protection plans, um, layout plans, materials plans, grading plans, all those things. Um, and then, uh, and then you'll have to cover a lot of similar information for, from the section one, uh, where you talk about contract administration and who's responsible for what and at what point, uh, to, or, and, how you hold them accountable, basically. Um, and then uh, there's, some people have said that there are questions relating to uh, setting up dimensioning systems, uh, setting up stationing along, like say a road, um, or, uh, or what different coordinate systems exist and how they're used. Uh, and then sometimes there's, questions related to irrigation systems, which is something that most landscape architects probably don't ever do, but, um, but they may ask you some questions related to that. I wouldn't say that you should spend a lot of time studying irrigation systems, but understanding the basic components of them and how they generally function will probably be of benefit to you. Yeah, so with irrigation, I think a big thing is like just understanding the different types of irrigation and, and when you use the different types of irrigation and just loosely how they function. Like where's the water coming from? What types of things are you trying to irrigate? What's the climate like there? Because some are more, some spray more, some are drip. Um, so it would be better under certain applications. So how are the exams structured? So this we just got straight out of the layer orientation guide. So each uh, exam has a different writing time. Um, you're supposed to get there half an hour early just to settle and make sure that everything is fine, that you're all signed, like, um, they, they have to like check you, make sure you're not bringing anything in and 
So section one is two and a half hours writing time and there's 85 multiple choice slash multiple response questions and 15 pretest items. So in the layer orientation guide, they go into detail what the pretest items are. So these are questions that are embedded in your exam that are not being tested, but they're put in there for future exams to see how people's knowledge function with those items. So if that would be a good exam question in the future. So section two is two hours writing time, 70 multiple choice, multiple response, and 10 pretest items. So section two is the, the shortest exam with the least questions. Section three is three and a half hours, is 85 multiple choice, multiple response, drag and drop and hotspot items, and 15 pretests. So the drag and drop and hotspot items, um, again, are explained at the beginning of the exam. Um, both in the layer orientation guide, but also when you sit down at the exam, they'll run you through examples of how to answer that question on the computer system, which is quite useful. And section four is four hours writing time, 105 multiple choice, multiple response, uh, et cetera, and 15 pretest items. So we've also provided a link here to the Clara YouTube video walkthrough on this. Yeah, so just to clarify, the pretest items are not identified when you write the exam either. So you don't know which questions are the pretest ones and which ones are not. So, um, but in some cases, you might get a pretest item that is not really related to the section that you're writing. Um, it'll, you'll maybe be like, why am I being asked this on? you know, the site inventory question, I'm being asked a question about project management. So that's generally a pretty good hint that it's not a tested question, but, um, but generally, you know, it's best to just go through the exam and not even really think about which items are pretest or not. Um, and just, you know, write the exam as best you can. Um, and, and this CLAR video, YouTube video, if you haven't watched it already, will walk you through what the, uh, the computer-based testing system looks like, um, how to answer different questions. Um, I think it's about like nine minutes long or something, so it's quite thorough. Um, and all of these uh, writing times that we've provided here you actually get a half an hour of additional time to sit um, at the beginning to go through the tutorial on how to write the exam on the system. So every time you will have to click through that tutorial, um, but uh, it doesn't take half an hour to click through, but if you want to sort of review it each time, you get half an hour of time that is not testing time to go through that. And if you flip through that fast, it doesn't mean you get an extra half an hour to write. Your, uh, your timer will reset and start at the appropriate amount of time. Yes, they are separate items. <laughs> so Mark and I had a conversation about things that we found the most useful when we were preparing for the layers. And so th these are just from our personal experience and some things that we thought might be useful. So, one of the best things that I found was purchasing these layer prep exams and they do cost money and that is an extra cost but I found that if I was going to write the exam I would always want to pay for this because other exams that you find might be useful but these ones actually run you through the process that's the most similar to the exam. So even just sitting down and being timed and having the process of answering multiple choice questions or multiple response questions, sorry, um, was really useful. And also these ones, they update regularly. So the questions change and are the most up to date out of all the study materials. So these ones I found the most useful and something that I did every time that I would do this exam was at the end of it, they give you a breakdown of all the questions that you got right and wrong. And something that I found useful was I wrote down the subjects of the questions I got wrong 
and I noted them and I studied them later or on those topics, I went back and I found additional resources for whether it was through a different book, through even just a Google search or asking a coworker or a friend or something like that. So although just going through the exam is useful, it's also good to actually use that information to figure out what areas you're lacking in. Yeah, so when I, uh, well, I've been working for quite a while before I started into this layer process. Um, so when I began studying, I actually started by purchasing and doing a practice exam to identify where my shortcomings were in my knowledge um, prior to studying and it helped me focus on the areas that I really needed to review rather than studying everything that's under the sun. Mm -hmm. um, so for me that was pretty useful and then they always they have two versions of each of the sections for practice tests so you can do one at the beginning do your studying do one closer to uh, your actual writing date uh, of different questions and you know hopefully by that point you're well on your way to passing it um, but uh, that that's that was a process that's worked for me so far um, yeah. just, sorry no. I was just gonna say that if you if you start by doing it right at the beginning and then keep doing them over and over again as a means of studying, then you might just memorize the questions. And I found that happened with my first exam was that I kept doing the two exams when I was studying. And at the end I was, I couldn't even tell if I knew the information or if I just memorized the question. So Mark's suggestion of maybe doing one at the beginning and finding some gaps in your knowledge is a great suggestion. And then doing the second one a little later on to just, sort of have new questions come up. So some other items are you could create some flashcards for key terms, which would be really, really useful. Um, Cross-referencing the topic breakdown for each test with table of contents from the suggested reading materials, and then only study that pertinent information from each book, kind of like what we mentioned before. Really read the questions carefully. So don't answer the question before you've read the entire question or don't answer it before you read all the options. And only consider what the question is asking. So it's really pertinent to just pick out exactly what they're asking and not use knowledge from prior questions that might not be applicable to what they're actually asking you that time. And there's also a box in each question where you can leave comments. So provide comments for questions you feel are confusing, misleading, or have multiple potential answers. So this is something that I've always kind of done throughout the exam process that even, even small things like if I've, you know, really genuinely felt like there were two answers, I've let them know kind of just why I thought that and what my reasoning for that was. I do know that they read the comments. They do definitely read the comments. Um, whether or not it would go into changing an answer, you know, I, I don't know. Mark, maybe you know. Like, it, if we were to leave a comment, how much would that affect? I think um, the comments are used primarily if there's a trend on a question where people tend to be getting the wrong answer or a similar answer that is not the answer that Clarb expected you to pick, right. then they will go back and review the comments provided on that question by test writers and see if there is a reasoning why people are gravitating towards another answer. Um, and if there is enough of a correlation or um, like a, enough people are doing it, they may score the question correct for that question, that answer as well. Or if it's an issue of um, just everybody getting the question wrong, um, then they may determine that the question itself was flawed and just 
toss that question out of their grading for that particular testing round. So, um, and so I think uh, like providing that clarification, it may not influence your particular test uh, immediately, but if there's enough of a correlation between everybody else writing the exams at the same time, then, um, then there may be some value in doing it. Um, but I would just caution people that it takes up a lot of time to write comments. So just make sure that you're not running out of time to finish your exam uh, and by writing comments for each question. Um, you obviously can't for every single question or you wouldn't have enough time to even answer every question. So, um, okay, so another tool that you can use on the exam is to flag questions you're unsure of to review at the end. And then at the end, all those questions that you flagged can come up and you can review again. So again, pace yourself, monitor the timer. And th this is this next point is something that I just did personally um, because I hadn't taken a test in, in quite some time after graduating. So I just spent a little bit of time reviewing general strategies for multiple choice test taking. Um, I just Googled strategies for multiple choice test taking or, or something along those lines. And I, I just read some people's tips and tricks for that, which again is like process of elimination. Make sure you read the whole question, um, take out the ones that you immediately know are wrong and then narrow down your choices from there. And book your exam time early to have a choice of time and location that works best for you because it's best not to feel stressed out on the day of. If you're running around, if you're say driving somewhere unfamiliar and you don't know where parking is, um, you, you just want to make sure that going into the exam, you feel okay, you know where you're going. And some people are morning people, some people are more evening people. So again, it, it just comes down to making sure that you book the time that works for you and however you're going to feel comfortable writing the exam. Um, and one other thing that I've noticed writing the exams is that um, occasionally they tend to the questions you get tend to have a bit of a theme to them or you'll get a lot of sort of similar questions on the same exam. Uh, but that's actually being done on purpose. So, uh, so don't let it throw you off if you feel like you're answering a similar question with a similar response multiple times within the same exam. Um, they're basically trying to make sure that you're not getting that particular uh, you know, concept correct because of a fluke guess rather than really actually understanding that concept and being able to apply it in different situations. So, um, so just don't, don't get like freaked out if you start to see a bunch of questions that seem like they're similar, um, just, keep powering through and trust that you know what you're talking about when you're writing it. Um, and don't, I think the best thing is just like, you can't second guess yourself while you're writing the test. Like you have to believe that your knowledge base is sufficient to carry you through answering these questions. So that's all that we have to say, really. Um, I think we have about, 15 minutes left um, and we'd love to field questions if anybody has any. Oh, so there is one question that was asked at the beginning of the presentation. And it was, what reading resources are recommended for the maintenance portion of exam one since Clarb recommended reading does not cover it? I do think that in construction contracts, there was a brief section on maintenance. Um, I, th I think it's, uh, yeah, I think they're, they're probably asking you more of a question on who is responsible for maintenance um, and at what points in the process of a project are different people responsible for maintenance on the site. 
Um, so I don't know if I, I like, I doubt that they're asking for a question relating to um, like how to maintain the site, but it would be more relating to warranties and, and who's responsible at what point. So um, I think in the contracts book that is covered. Um, I, hope yeah, that I remember it being very brief though. Like it, it was, it's a very small section of the book. So I don't remember there being a big amount of questions on the exam. Um, again, it depends on what exam you get, um, what things will be more distributed between. Um, I do think that it is covered in that book though, a little bit. If anyone else has any other questions, we would be happy to try and help. Okay, there's a question about bedrock. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what's your question, Karen? Uh, I think, um, so you're, you're trying to ask a question about like, um, sometimes they'll give you, yeah, like a soil profile and they'll ask you to select the best location. So they'll give you three or four soil profiles. Um, they'll give you a, a map associate that locates the soil profiles within a given fictional site. And, um, and they'll ask you a question like say, uh, maybe it's a building siting or maybe it's like a parking lot or maybe they're asking you what location is best for, um, for a stormwater pond. Um, so you'll, have to use those profiles and then sort of the basic contours on the site to try to determine the best locations for these things. Um, in terms of bedrock um, and buildings, I think like typically bedrock is like the most stable ground. So if your basement depth that the question is asking you is going to put you under the level of the bedrock, then I would say that is the incorrect answer. Um, but typically there would be one that would say like, uh, you know, your basement unit, your basement will be four units deep and then there might be a soil profile or two that has bedrock at four units deep. And then I would say that that's probably the correct one to select. So, um, but I, I mean, I'm not an expert, but that would be <laughs> where I would go. So Amber asked, can you take more than one exam at a time? Yes, you can. You can take as many during one exam period as you, as you feel comfortable taking. Obviously you can't take them at the same time, but you could, um, take them back to back if you'd like. Yeah. So the testing window is two weeks long each time. So you can you can schedule, as long as you have signed up early enough, you can really schedule your exams to your particular needs within that two week window. Um, sometimes, like I would, I would really suggest that you don't take more than two at a time. And, and if you do take two at a time, then often people will try and stagger them so that you write one at the beginning of the two weeks and then one towards the end of the two weeks. So you have like some time between the two to like just make sure you're brushed up on the second one studying before it comes along. Um, and then if you're going to do that, um, I have heard that it's suggested that you, that section two and three are the most closely related in terms of 
studying materials. And then sections one and four are the most closely related in terms of studying materials. So if you want to you know, try and like get some double bang for your time, then I would say those are the pairs that you would write together. But um, just keep in mind, like if you haven't written one yet, I would suggest you start with just one. Uh, and just make sure that you are comfortable with the way in which uh, the testing process works and the material. And then maybe in the second round, you can try two if you want to. Um, but uh, really, like at the end of the day, I think everybody has to do two years of professional work experience logs with their association. So you're really not in a rush to get through the exams if you haven't already completed that. So um, like there's no benefit to you to finish within six months rather, or like four months rather than taking a year or, you know, a year and a half to write them. Okay, I think there's more questions. What legislation, legal aspects are important for exam one? Uh, for exam one, you really need to understand uh, all of the terms that would, like legal terms that would happen in a contract. So, um, you know, they're gonna ask you questions about like remedies and contract issues and understand what those various terms mean. And I think on uh, exam one is the most, the easiest one or the one that flashcards work the best for like i would go through that contracts book and pick out a bunch of those legal terms that you are not already like very familiar with and write down what the definitions of those are and where what they're applicable to and try to memorize them as best you can because those are the that, those are the things that are going to probably trip you up the most on exam one um in terms of legal questions. Um, but also exam one is very heavily on project management and project process. So you really need to know that too. So uh, yeah, for that question as well, I'd, suge I'd suggest in terms of legal aspects, that could just come down to what a landscape architect is legally allowed to do and what the other consultants are legally allowed to do. It, it's mostly in terms of like who delivers what and where we would get in trouble legally providing services and, and stuff like that. that. That's the way that I would interpret that. For me, I think uh, there were definitely questions on types of contracts. Um, and I'm trying to think back to, it was a long time ago when I wrote section one, um, but I, I seem to recall questions related to like, um, well, I, I can't remember the specific term right now, but, um, but there, there's definitely, like I would just go through that contracts book like really thoroughly because it's gonna be, your best friend for question for exam one. Yeah. Um, and Karen suggests number two. She started with number two and passed right away. Um, I started with number one. I had been working for six years before I wrote it um, and was really familiar with the project management process already. But um, I found that the contracts portion of it was uh, there were definitely terms that I was unfamiliar with and so that I think unless you've had some experience uh, I've heard exam one can be tricky uh, because you will have a lot of information to study and to remember um, so I would suggest that you unless you have working experience and have been exposed to proposal writing to um, budgeting to uh, contract administration, then it's probably going to be um, a lot of material to study to understand. And yeah. you might want to 
you might want to find a study buddy or somebody that you work with who has more experience in that that um, can help you through understanding the, the different players and the components of a project um, because it could still be confusing uh, after reading through the material. So you might want somebody to sit down and kind of like walk you through the process um, just so you have it in your head. Yeah, I was just going to say that I wrote exam one probably with only about a year's worth of professional experience and I found it very challenging and I had to study a lot. It was a lot of learning new terms and a lot of learning processes that I hadn't been exposed to yet. So pros and cons to that because I learned everything exactly by the book, how they were going to ask the questions um, without being sort of muddled by my own professional experience, which might not be exactly what they want you to answer. But again, it, it was a lot of studying. So it's just a lot of memorization. All right, are there any last questions? I think we had about two minutes here. Great, I'm glad that uh, people found this useful. Since we seem to be out of questions, I just want to take a second and thank uh, Leah and Mark for leading this. Um, we're taking August off. Uh, next session will be in September. Um, but on behalf of uh, BCSLA, OALA, and AALA, thanks everyone for coming out. Thanks so much to Leah and Mark for uh, leading this session. Um, we really appreciate it. It's, it's, uh, it's great to have people that are in the thick of it that can lead these sorts of sessions and give some new context. Um, the September session, I believe, is we're going to be having Clark back to answer a different sort of session set of quest questions than they answered a few months ago. Um, but other than that, everyone should have a really great weekend. Uh, hopefully, it's uh, in the mid 20s here in Alberta, so hopefully, you're getting good weather where you are. Um, other than that, have a great day and good luck to those of you that are going to write in August. Yeah, good luck on your exams, everyone. <laughs>